Okay, I think we should get started. Welcome everybody. Um, it's wonderful to have so many of you here in the room and also um, to know that there are so many of you um, who are joining us online as well. My name is Katherine Clegg Smith and I'm the Vice Dean for Faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'm honored to be here today on behalf of Dean Ellen McKenzie to introduce today's speaker. But before I do that, I'd like to recognize what brings us together here today. Um, the Dean's Lectures series was established to highlight the extraordinary work of our newly appointed and promoted professors and senior scientists at the Bloomberg School. Attaining the appointment of professor represents an exceptional achievement by a senior faculty member and confirms not only the respect and high regard of their colleagues here in the school, but also of colleagues across the nation and throughout the world. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Inglesby. Professor Inglesby is a director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and holds joint appointments here at the Bloomberg School and also in the School of Medicine. He's internationally recognized as an expert in public health preparedness, particularly when it comes to pandemics and biological threats. And so, as you can imagine, it's, he's been quite busy over the past two years. Since COVID-19 took hold, we've all faced relentless challenges and constant change. While much of the world was caught off guard, Professor Inglesby had been thinking about a scenario like this for much of his career. Throughout the COVID-19 pan, COVID pandemic, Dr. Inglesby has been a trusted, relied upon voice, providing decision makers with much needed guidance and counsel. He's given technical advice to response efforts at the global, national, state, and local level. And in fact, he recently completed his temporary assignment as a senior advisor for testing as part of the White House's COVID-19 response team. Today, we have the opportunity to not only learn more about his experiences during the pandemic, but also to hear about his vision about how we can safeguard the world in the future. Professor Inglesby received his BA from Georgetown University and his MD from Columbia University. He completed his internal medicine residency and infectious disease fellowship at Johns Hopkins. He was on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh for many years before returning to Johns Hopkins in 2016. In his role with the Center for Health Security, Dr. Inglesby helps protect people from epidemics and disasters through his independent research, policy analysis, and program assessment. He's known for his exceptional ability to quickly analyze new data and science and think strategically about protecting the health and lives of entire populations. Dr. Inglesby has briefed White House officials in four presidential administrations on national biosecurity challenges and priorities, and he's delivered congressional testimony on vital issues related to public health preparedness. He's also the author of more than 170 scientific publications and is regularly sought out by the national media to comment on pandemics and public health preparedness. Through all of this work, Professor Inglesby is striving to build a future in which severe pandemics no longer threaten our, our world. He will tell you that he first started down this path in 1998 when he heard a speech by DA, by DA Henderson. As many of you know, Dr. Henderson served as a Dean of the Bloomberg School for 13 years and was a leader of the WHO's smallpox eradication program. On the day that Dr. Inglesby, excuse me, Inglesby heard him speak, Dr. Henderson was delivering a, a warning. Major biological threats were coming, whether man-made or natural, and the world wasn't ready for them. Dr. Inglesby says that that day changed his life. He introduced himself to Dr. Henderson and volunteered to help him with his work. Soon, Dr. Henderson was launching a center focused on health security and inviting Dr. Inglesby to join him. After the center was founded in 1998, new threats came quickly. West Nile, anthrax, SARS, Ebola. The center grew to include more researchers and practitioners. And today, under Dr. Inglesby's leadership, it conducts a broad and impressive array of work aimed at improving understanding and collaboration on health security issues. Every day, Dr. Inglesby and his colleagues are protecting us from urgent threats before us and from the future hazards that most of us have not yet thankfully imagined. While Dr. Inglesby listened to DA Henderson speak more than 20 years ago, he understood the severity of the dangers ahead, and that took great vision. 
He also committed himself to the complex world, excuse me, complex work of addressing those dangers. And that took great tenacity. We are grateful for all that he has achieved since that day. He's made a profound impact on his field and he continues to build a safer, healthier future for us all. Professor Inglesby, welcome. We're excited to hear from you today. Thank you. I was also meant to say that if you have anyone online, if you have questions um, to ask, please um, put them in the chat privately to Becky Newcomer and she'll, coll she'll collect them and share them with, with us at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks to you and to Ellen for that lovely, uh, really generous uh, opening. And I am very happy to be with you all today to, to talk a little bit about what we've been learning in COVID and the future ahead and thinking through pandemic preparedness and response and what this school and this university and universities writ large can be doing to contribute to that work. And so let me start by saying, let's see. Okay, just, just to give you the basis of, of my remarks uh, are in part uh, based on different vantage points that I had during this pandemic. And uh, if you go back to just, just more than two years ago, I started the pandemic with my incredible colleagues at the center working through the very early days and thinking through the response to the pandemic. It was a, a pretty, you all lived through it, you all remember it, so we won't spend any time on it at the moment, but it was a busy time for all of us at the school and uh, there was a lot to do. A year later, I was just finished volunteering for the Biden-Harris transition into the White House and began work of, as an advisor to the Secretary of Health in HHS in DC. And then this February, I had recently moved uh, from HHS to the White House in December and was there until two weeks ago. So that's a little basis of where I'm coming from and my thoughts. And what I think I'm gonna do is I am going to, I spent a little bit of time talking about what's going on now in the pandemic, just a snapshot of where we are, and then spend a little bit of time about what we should be doing about COVID, and then a little more time on what we should be doing about the pandemic going forward. So first of all, let's just focus a little bit on the global moment in COVID. And you can see from this, the New York Times still does an incredible job every day uh, summarizing data from around the world. But just a quick snapshot here, you can see in the bottom left of your screen that a lot of the world is moving in the right direction as of now. And if you look at the, the big regions, uh, but you can see the red line is, is moving upward and that is US and Canada. It's the only line on the rise. And if you look at hot spots around the world, of course, you can see US and Canada are hotter. And uh, partly that's testing, but partly that's real. Skipping to a particular area of concern uh, in the last two weeks is South Africa, where we are now seeing a very steep rise in cases and uh, beginning to see a rise in hospitalizations. South Africa has been a harbinger of what was to come in Europe and the US in the past. We don't know that that will hold at this point. Different parts of the world are moving in different directions in ways that, that wasn't true a year ago. We have different vaccination rates, different infection rates, different societies with different levels of immunity and vulnerability. But if South Africa is at least a, par a partial harbinger, we should be being very mindful of uh, the kind of pressure that we could be under again in the weeks or month or two ahead. You can also see on the right-hand side a tweet from uh, one of the most eminent scientists in South Africa who is describing there the ratio of variants that are being found in cases. And what you're seeing there is a rise in BA4 and BA5, which are subvariants of Omicron, which uh, we are only beginning to see in the United States. We have a relatively small number of cases just in the low double digits so far detected, probably just representing a substantial number more, but for the most part, we continue to have BA2 dominating in the United States. And what we don't know is whether BA4, BA5 will affect the US in ways that partially or, or uh, very much resemble South Africa, in which case we would have um, much more trouble ahead. In the United States, you can see on the bottom left, 
that we're beginning to see a rise in cases. Uh, we expected that already from BA2. So this doesn't yet reflect, we don't believe BA4, BA5, but was already on the move upward, BA2, resembling to some extent what was happening possibly in Europe. Quick snapshot from the incredible Coronavirus Resource Center in the upper left-hand corner, which is summing up on a daily basis all that uh, we are experiencing in the world. And you see that we are unfortunately not very many uh, deaths away from a million deaths in the United States, which is an incredibly tragic milestone, which we're likely to probably face uh, sometime in May, given current trajectories. You can also see across the top here that uh, testing certainly has come down from the Omicron peak, but is above what we were doing last summer. And this includes a, an enormous shift to home testing, which is not being counted here for the most part. So I would assume when you see those numbers there, assume we're, we, that is a, a perhaps 30 to 50% of the testing going on, maybe less, uh, but still a substantial amount of testing on a daily basis, 650,000 tests that are recorded, laboratory tests that are recorded. The number of hospitalizations you can see is uh, just beginning to rise. Numbers of deaths are continuing to go down. Fortunately, they're a lagging indicator. Hopefully they stay down, but they do lag behind other indicators. Quick snapshot of vaccine data in the United States, some of which is encouraging, some of which is not. Uh, 257 million people out of 330 million-ish people in the US have had a first dose. 220 million have had uh, two doses, and unfortunately, less than a third overall have been boosted, which means that a lot of America is particularly remains particularly vulnerable. Fortunately, the elderly population has been more boosted than the younger population, so it's not uh, certainly not proportional across the population. The, the higher risk people are more likely to have had a booster, but we can do a lot better with booster. About half a million doses of vaccine being delivered every day. 200,000 of those are about, about our fourth doses of booster. So that's basically telling us that people who were vaccinated in the first place and boosted continue to be interested in vaccine. Unfortunately, not enough people who weren't vaccinated or weren't boosted continue to be interested in getting vaccine. And so you can see that results in a pretty wide range of, of uh, experiences in states from Rhode Island doing very well to Alabama and uh, unfortunately, North Carolina showing very low boosting rates. So kind of showing a, quite a vulnerability to potential uh, problems ahead. Another slide about where we are. Uh, this is from Biobot, which is a, uh, a really well done uh, analytics uh, group that studies wastewater surveillance around the country. And this is their sum up. They do it regionally as well. But in summary, you can see that uh, wastewater uh, wastewater signals are on the rise, which have been a signal for us before for um, past surges. So again, uh, a sign that we are probably looking at least a modest surge. We don't know the, the level of rise that's coming, but we can see that we are probably moving upward substantially, at least for a time. And then a few points about trends, which I think is also somewhat concerning about the moment we're in. If you look at the 42 jurisdictions out of about, I think the total number of jurisdictions between states and territories is 64. So 42 of 64 have a 10% week over week rise in cases and 32 hospitalizations, 40 of them are experiencing a percent rise in, in uh, test positivity. So that is worrisome, um, kind of drifting in the wrong, in the wrong direction there. Deaths uh, remain in the country, mostly in the unvaccinated, but you probably all have seen this data, which shows that the percent of people who are vaccinated that are represent those who've died has gone up. So it's up to 42% in uh, the last couple of months or the beginning of this year. Those people were, for the most part, not boosted or more vulnerable. So not again, not perfectly proportional. And we also saw last week, another just interesting data point to think about, about 60% of the country looks like it, it has people, 60% of people in the country look like they've had past infection. And uh, there's been a little kind of glass half empty, glass half full reaction to that number. Some people might say, well, if I really am more likely than not having been infected, then why should I go get vaccinated if I haven't been vaccinated already? The glass half full, half empty, which I would be in, would say there's still 40% of the country that has no evidence of infection. And even if you were infected, 
duration of immunity does not last particularly long and is much better if combined with vaccination. Okay, so this all kind of thinking through where we are, I think some of the important um, uh, takeaways around the ongoing response to COVID, we can all see and we're all experiencing, we know that SARS-CoV-2 will continue to cause morbidity and mortality at some level for some time. We don't know if we're gonna have a big rise or, or a relatively modest rise and then back down again, but we, we're not over COVID. Uh, people, I know we're, we're certainly moving back towards normal. We have more tools than we've ever had before. We have more vaccine, more therapies, more tests, more masks, and more immunity. So we are doing better as a country by far, but we are not completely through this. And I know that's, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging for us to kind of stay on this topic for this long. There is a mis misplaced complacency in a lot of Washington that things are kind of towards an end, that we're linearly moving towards the finish line. And we are not. We don't know exactly what's ahead, but we need to be prepared for variants or surges ahead in ways that are unpredictable. The Delta variant, the Omicron variants came on with really very little notice. If you look back in November or October, you could see that modelers around the country were not predicting anything like Omicron. Even in November in the United States, there was within the government and outside of the government, there was very little signal or, or kind of gravitating around a big event other than kind of a possible rise of the same trends that we'd experienced back in the fall. So we, we, can't, we can't reliably predict more than a couple, a month at the most, maybe two months uh, in terms of what's coming in the United States. We don't know exactly what's gonna happen with BA4, BA5 or other things that may emerge. So we need to be ready for variants and surges. And we have to be we have to be committed to building the capacity for that and having the funding around that. The administration has asked Congress for funding for vaccine supply for boosters, vaccine for new variants, antivirals that are coming down the pike, which are better than the ones that we have, testing infrastructure, uninsured fund. All these things have been requested to, from the administration to Congress, and they have not been funded at this point. Congress, when it comes back, hopefully will take that up. I think they're considering a number that is far, far lower than the administration requested, but it would be a good start in moving towards some of those unmet needs. And on a global level, the Congress does not seem to be interested at all yet in $5 billion that has been requested by the administration for support of USAID efforts to help with the global fight, both in vaccine testing and antivirals and capacity building. So hopefully that also will change uh, with more discussion, more dialogue, the administration and Congress. And of course, we all know we have the continued work of recovery, institution building around the country, there are enormous economic losses, and uh, that's starting to come back, but also enormous mental health tolls, which in many places are very persistent and, and uh, very difficult for communities. So that's all going on. That's the ongoing COVID work, which we'll need to continue. We're not done with that. But at the same time, a portion of our bandwidth and our, our energies, for some of us at least, should be turning towards the process of preparing for future pandemics. And why should we do that? Well, COVID is, is not the only pandemic that the country or the world could face in the future. And in fact, the World Health Organization has a name for the things that they anticipate coming, which they would call disease X. They and others have called it disease X. And WHO leaders consider those kinds of events to be probable. And they, do, they consider them probable based on the staccato nature of major either regional national, regional, or global events that have occurred in the last 20, 25 years, and their assessment that things will continue on that trajectory, as well as the other forces in the world, the impingement onto ecosystems, travel, the number of people living in poverty, the conditions are favoring future pandemics. It was widely believed coming into COVID that influenza was our biggest and only serious pandemic threat. That was a, obviously a huge miscalculation, but that was uh, it, was, it was received wisdom um, in many places. And when people talked about pandemic planning, they really meant planning for influenza. We, we now know that that is, that is a uh, false um, assertion or false conclusion. Uh, our center itself, I, I included a photo here from 2019. Uh, our group and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, put together an exercise around coronavirus pandemics um, back in October 2019. 
And that helped us begin to think about the implications of it. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of time after that exercise before we were actually in the middle of an actual coronavirus pandemic. But we are now, again, thinking about the kinds of exercises, the preparedness that we need for the future, and possibly something else with the Gates Foundation later this year to think about the future of pandemic planning and exercises. But the message, the main message here is that we need to take the time that we have before the next pandemic to better prepare the country and the world for managing these kinds of events. And so I'm gonna just, the rest of my talk is gonna be in these categories of effort. I want to, to, I'm gonna to recommend to you all and, uh, and try to make the case that we should be building a series of enduring capabilities that are all partially built, but need to be stronger. We need to be accelerating vaccines, medicines, testing, development work, procurement work, distribution. Again, that is a, we are on the path in that right direction. We need to recognize the centrality and expertise around highly effective communication. And you all live in a place which has incredible communication expertise. I don't think anyone's used to, like aware of the level of energy and resource as compared to many other places in the world, but with Lamar, Lamario Morales and Margaret Miller and Robin Scullin uh, leading the way around communications. Um, we've got great resources here and we need to really think through how we become the most skilled communicators we can be because we will all be important assets for epidemics and pandemics in the future. And we need to earn people's trust in order to move forward in those kinds of moments. We also need to strengthen and invest in the government and that sounds kind of boring, but it's not. Uh, I'm gonna make say a few things about why the government is absolutely crucial in our efforts, in addition to the private sector and academia and all and civil society, equity, investing in equity now and in crisis, and then focusing again on what we do at Bloomberg and in universities beyond uh, Johns Hopkins. So starting with enduring capabilities, and I'm just gonna quickly, I have a slide on each of these just to say a bit about early warning detection, engaging communities in the work, working with political leadership, planning for this category of effort, which we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include social distancing. It used to also be called community mitigation measures. Uh, say more about that in a moment. We need the work of preparing our healthcare system, looking at what worked, what did not work, what failed in the last couple of years. And of course, the work that we all do in different ways all the time is thinking about how we strengthen public health. So an early warning detection and forecasting. I think the first thing that's probably self-evident to everybody here, but not necessarily uh, in leadership um, in national governments, is the importance of good international relationships. When things go wrong in different parts of the world, it is really important to be able to pick up the phone and to be able to share knowledge and science and samples quickly. And that partially worked uh, in our interaction uh, at the beginning of, of this pandemic and partially failed. And in part, it partially worked because of people like Dr. Li, who was one of the early scientists who recognized what was going on in China and spread the word about what was happening to colleagues, both within China and elsewhere in the world. Unfortunately, he was punished for that, arrested, and tragically subsequently died of, of COVID. Uh, but people like him, and then people in official government positions who are in the position to be able to share samples and to share knowledge quickly. And again, I think partly that worked at the start of this pandemic and partly it broke down and we didn't get everything we needed and we didn't get it quickly enough and we can do better. We can learn from that and we have to. Uh, we also need to have an earlier recognition of coming pandemics. Even in February in the United States, of 20, in 2020, February, United States, the most common things you were seeing on TV were about uh, how you know various basketball games are going, the usual social media, the usual you know political back and forth. There was very little about the prospect of a pandemic coming to the United States. It was all about what was happening in China with an assumption that it would stay in China. And I think the rhetoric from the top of the government confirmed that bias uh, and people really did not doubt, tune into it until it was actually happening in our hospitals. And we should be able to anticipate a little better than that. It was pretty clear um, early on that things were really breaking down pretty quickly in China. They were building temporary hospitals. Uh, things were locked down in cities of millions of people. And there should never have been an assumption in any government 
that we would have been able to keep it there. It was all a matter of time. And so that was, you know, our, our that, that first box there is how to prepare for a coronavirus pandemic. That was our attempt to try and be much more uh, direct about that. It was one of the early articles published in the US about assuming that we will have a pandemic and we need to start preparing for that immediately. But even within March, by the time we were in early March, we were, there was still some hope that we'd be able to contain it, uh, which was very misplaced. We need rapid sequencing capabilities. That really has been built up as a capacity in the United States. A lot of money has been spent on that, but it needs to become a kind of a more integrated system. And we need stronger forecasting capabilities. One major step forward there is the, the uh, creation of the Center for Forecasting and Analytics. And I think kind of we should have a little pride at Johns Hopkins because one of our Johns Hopkins Bloomberg's colleagues, Caitlin Rivers and other colleagues were both had the idea for this center and are now in the process of establishing it on temporary uh, temporary government service. And uh, that is a bipartisan uh, supported center. I think there are no detractors from it, which is rare. Everybody loves it. Uh, the top of the administration loves it and talks about it. And so um, it is something like new things can be built in the government. Uh, ideas from outside the government can come in and make a difference. And we, of course, within our own institution, strong epidemiology, modeling, analytics, risk assessment will continue to be very important. Building, building leaders who can do that work and doing that work itself in crisis when uh, things need to be answered. A next area of effort, which uh, may get kind of little attention at times because it may seem like a little off the beaten path, but I think we would argue that work with political leaders, mostly in crisis, but to the extent it's possible ahead of time is really important because they are making many of the decisions around authorities, around funding, around interventions, around guidance and communication. And if they are doing the right things, and in many cases, they did really, really good things for across the pandemic, then things will go well in places where they are governing. And if they don't have access to good information, they don't trust it, or they move in different directions, then things can go quite badly. And we see an example of like just one data point, distinctions between North Carolina and Vermont as one little data point on one axis of who's gotten more boosters. But we all can think of moments on a, almost a weekly basis in the first year of this pandemic where political leaders who were getting good guidance and were really kind of moving in good directions were doing these kinds of things. And on the other end of the spectrum, there were others who were making decisions that were less valuable for people living in those states or those cities. And all of that's important in terms of building trust and transparency. I think we're lucky to have a mayor who made many, many good decisions. And uh, I think. Um, other political leaders, I think our governor made many good decisions. It was, you know, there were, there were, there were uh, many challenges along the way. And I think people began to have different decision making over time. But I think uh, at the start of the pandemic in particular, uh, things were going, I, I think in Maryland did a really good job uh, balancing that. Uh, another area of effort, effort here, engaging communities. This also seems like, is that really a public health effort? I think it is. Uh, it's definitely something that, again, makes and can make an enormous difference in the way that a community lives through or manages through a terrible event like this pandemic. People trust their local leaders and community leaders uh, often much, much more than they do leaders at a distance. And as a guiding principle, we should be doing whatever we can to give local leaders, state leaders and community organizers, religious leaders as much controlled implementation as possible within good expert scientific guidance, because they're the ones who know what's happening in their own communities, particularly when in things like school programs or programs of assistance or programs where we're supporting people who are in quarantine or doing contact tracing. Those are all really locally based programs which benefit from local knowledge and trust and relationships. And one of the other principles, I think this predated the pandemic, but I think is particularly true here, which is we should not be trying to do things for communities without listening to them or getting representation from them. Don't do something for me without my help, or don't do something for this community without a person from that community. Non-pharmaceutical interventions, we touched on this earlier. These are the kinds of things that were done 
prior to when we had a vaccine or medications, and then beyond that, um, really potentially important interventions that slow this slow the transmission of this pandemic down. We we know that in the future, even if we are faster at making vaccines and medicines, we are going to have periods of time where we will not have those vaccines and medicines. And it is possible that we could face a pandemic where we don't we do not have a vaccine or we do not have medications. Hopefully that will not happen. We're going to do everything we can in the future to try and make vaccine and medicine development uh, even stronger. But we should prepare for the possibility that we will not have that, at least for some time. And so that's why now, uh, between or before we have a pandemic uh, of the future, we should be studying much more intensely and building consensus around and planning to use these these interventions, which some of which became quite controversial and politically charged. They didn't start the pandemic that way, but they became that way. And we now have a much wider set of a wider evidence base. It's still a difficult area to study. A number of my colleagues at the center have spent a lot of time studying these interventions. And it is not an easy thing to study because there are many things happening at once. There are many co-variables, lots of moving parts. But we need to do whatever we can to try to understand where they worked, where they didn't work, under what conditions we would use them, and be able to explain them to people and why they're justified. I think loose terms like lockdowns are not particularly helpful. They got used for all sorts of things in the United States. If anything, I think what China is doing now is truly a lockdown by definition. People are locked in their homes. But otherwise, asking people to avoid certain kinds of gatherings for a period of time, that's not the same thing as what China is doing. So we need language that's really descriptive and clear and more precise. And we need to understand uh, in what conditions we would want to use these things in the future, because we will need to use these things again in, the, in a future pandemic should that arise. The healthcare system went through huge uh, shocks, particularly in the first year of this pandemic, particularly before we had a vaccine. And it was not well prepared. They were our healthcare workers were not well served with with the tools that were that were made available to them. We did not have PPE for them. Many of them were exposed and at very high risk, and many lost their lives. Uh, it's particularly in the first year of this pandemic, and so we can't let that happen again. We have to be ready for short notice events. We did not have a lot of lead time from the time we started seeing what was happening in China to the time it was in the United States was less than two months. And there's no nothing to say that a, a pandemic couldn't start in the United States. So we don't have a lot of lead time, which implies that we need ready, ready supplies and reserves of personal protective equipment so that hospitals would be ready to go the next time. This is not a particularly complicated problem. It's just a money problem. And it has been partially solved by HHS now. They are stockpiling substantial amounts of personal protective equipment as compared to before this at the start of this pandemic. But we still can do better. We need new PPE that's easier to wear, that people can wear both in hospitals and hopefully public use as a second use. We also need a better capability in, in expanding ICU should that be needed. We came very close to in some places not having enough ICU capacity and doctors and nurses having to make choices about who would live and who would die. Um, we may have crossed that line in a few places in the United States, but for the most part, capacity was able to keep, just keep up. We also certainly are going to need longer term and crisis mental health support for people who had to make these decisions, are still making these decisions across the country uh, and helping people um, in terrible situations. And then a, a number of ways that people are working on expanding healthcare capacity, including what pharmacists can do, what telehealth can do, and uh, make sure we can pay for this uh, in the future. Similarly, in the world of public health, we went through a really an extraordinary and for the most part, very challenging and difficult time for public health leaders, public health officials, people working in agencies, people working within universities as well, but certainly the pressure on people working in public health organizations on the ground was, was really intense in the last couple of years. Many of those leaders were rejected by their um, political leadership, either forced out or pressured out including uh, one friend of mine, Dr. Kathy Slemp, who was the public health official in West Virginia, doing everything right, uh, working day and night, and uh, unfortunately was blamed uh, for something that was relatively trivial, uh, but for the most part um, was not uh, being supported by her governor for, for telling truths and for trying to get things under control. Um, as she is a Johns Hopkins alumna and uh, uh, a terrific example of a public health leader 
someone who was um, uh, kind of didn't get uh, the support they needed to, in a very, very difficult time. We need to do what we can to protect public health leaders, stick by them. Universities can do that. We are independent. We can raise our voices and try and defend people who are under political, political pressure like that. Public health also needs an infusion of funding around data infrastructure, which has been badly neglected. It's beginning to get that with some of the coronavirus resource funding or, or sorry, coronavirus uh, uh, relief funding uh, that's come from the uh, supplementals coming from Congress, but uh, it's not there yet. We have a lot of work to do. And I would say here, you know, that the lack of infrastructure I think in public health agencies, but also the speed uh, that's required to really do things um, quickly in crisis. Uh, I think the inability of public health to do that really led to a moment where Johns Hopkins, particularly uh, the Coronavirus Resource Center was able to do incredible things for this country and the world in terms of the way that they uh, gather data, scrape data from websites around the world, put it together um, and uh, Lauren deserves an enormous amount of credit for that and her team. And finally, I think the, at the last bullet, the Commonwealth Fund Commission, this is something uh, Dr. McKenzie is a commissioner on this. I think it's a great moment uh, that Commonwealth is funding to try and look at public health and think through what we, the window is open temporarily. That is a kind of a classic policy, policy uh, adage, which is when there is a crisis, there's often interest in making a change and making a fix in the window policy window will open and then it will close. And the window is still open. And uh, it's great that both Josh Sharpstein as a uh, one of the uh, directors of the effort and uh, Dr. McKinsey are uh, on this important effort and we hope it will get legs and really drive reform. Okay, a few words on communications. So I think um, just a few words first about what I observed on the federal level and then kind of moving around to different parts of communication. I think there's been a kind of a criticism I've heard, you know, kind of here and there about how the government just needs to get its act together and so many voices and it's so you know discombobulated. And what I would say there is it's true. It's not always the government, government leadership isn't always perfectly on the same page, but it is a big government. It's a big country and there are many, many issues and you could have a room full of people. Let's take 10 leaders, put them together. They could all in principle agree on something and a course of, you know, a certain course of action. But then when you put them with 10 different reporters over the next couple of days, there is a bit of daylight between people. It may be that honestly, Dr. Fauci might honestly have a slightly different view as something, some other leader that's also correct, but slightly different, slightly differently communicated or a variant, kind of a variant, uh, like a detail of something. And so what I would just say is um, we should do whatever we can to be in sync in the federal government, but it is, it is a big challenge and there's a lot of work that goes on, I think every day to try and make sure that the government is speaking with one voice. But when you have a White House, you have FDA, you have CDC, you have NIH, you have international efforts. It's a lot to get things going in the same direction. And it's, every day there's an effort to try and anticipate what does, what does the public want to know? What does the press want to know? Let's think through the questions. Let's think through the answers. Let's get all of our leaders together on that. And it's, it's again, a very, very large challenge to keep that operation going day in, day night, day in, day, day, in, day out, day and night uh, to, to try and get that government synced. When some new uh, program is being rolled out, like take an example, like the test to treat program that the president announced in the State of the Union, when that is announced, there is a huge effort across the government to reach out to all of the people that are going to be touched by this program. So there is the press release, which is what's straightforward. But there's also the notification of all the industry partners. There's the notification of all the advocates, any Hill leader that has been involved or will be involved in funding it, every governor who's going to be affected by this, the agencies that will be doing the work in the federal government and the operations on the ground. And all of those really need to happen around the same moment or else people feel like they were not informed. And when they're asked about it, they're upset about it. And so the, just thinking about the whole rollout and the whole process and strategy of communication, it seems like it might be straightforward from a distance, but it's quite a complicated strategy in science. And I just think we all kind of should recognize it. We have great expertise here in the building, again, to help us uh, 
plan for that if we're if we're part of that kind of effort in the future. And and the other thing I would say is as people are kind of here or on Zoom, kind of thinking about health leadership positions that they may be stepping into at some point in their futures. Not only do those jobs require a real understanding of the science of the day, they also require people to be able to communicate effectively, which is not necessarily straightforward. They need to be current. They need to know what's going on in their own programs and to be able to do all of that under pressure. That is a fairly complicated set of skills. And so again, just an overall argument that we should be spending substantial time in making sure that we're good communicators. Same goes for people who are communicating in the private sector, people communicating in universities. We're going to come back to that in a, in a minute. And a particular example of communication here is around vaccination strategy and implementation. You all know this, the whole effort to communicate around vaccine that happened in the last, uh, particularly in the last 18 months before vaccine started and throughout huge effort within the government and within states and within NGOs and community organizations polling analysis, subgroup analysis, everyone tried to understand why people were disinterested or unhappy or what would make them excited about it. And despite all this effort, we still have a pretty, you know, an important minority in the country that has decided not to get vaccinated. And that was with a huge, really well-funded effort that was really well organized. And people who ran it in government were people who came in from the private sector with a lot of skill and a lot of commitment. So we got more work to do. We got 90,000 free vaccination sites still giving out vaccine every day if you want it, but still a lot of the countries decided that it's not interested in that just yet. Globally, we have donated more vaccine than any other country by far, and we have a commitment to donate a lot more. But right now, countries are not as interested in getting the vaccine. So in the beginning, they of course wanted it. Right now, it's more along the lines of them uh, feeling like, or, or truly not being able to distribute it quickly enough, not being able to store it, uh, not being able to implement those programs. So what they really need from us and from other countries is not just help with vaccine, but with vaccine administration. And then just a word about misinformation. Uh, we all see this, we saw this across the country uh, in so many different ways. We know a number of things now. We know we need to use trusted messengers. We need to over communicate the good, drown out the bad. It was very exciting to see the Surgeon General bring this up and make it his own issue. Uh, we know we need to engage social media. That's quite complicated because if you push it too far, obviously we begin to step on um, step on facts. President Obama spoke to spoke about this this weekend. Has some interesting ideas about how to manage this problem. Uh, and certainly building public health and digital literacy. This is a report I just hear uh, my colleagues at the center put together, uh, led by Tara Kirksell. Great report that really gives very strong recommendations on what we should be doing. Um, really important set of issues. I raise this here only because uh, this is my little journey in communications over the last couple of years. I think whether you're independently communicating or whether you're working or representing an agency, uh, there are many different ways that we've been we will be asked to communicate. Whether it's you know, advising a particular political leader, or on social media, or uh, with legislators, and in my last uh, position, working uh, on particularly on testing issues. But whatever the particular area of communication, the principles are the same, which are basically. I mean, this is one version of it. There are other versions of this, but. You say what you know and what's true. You admit and say what you don't know. You say what you're doing to try and find out what you don't know and what you're trying to do to fix the problems that you aren't handling. You fix it when you're wrong and you admit it and you're honest. And not that that will perfectly, perfectly succeed every time, but I think these are a version of the principles that I think uh, communication leaders and masters will put forth and we really need to do that to earn people's trust and to maintain it. Because once you break the trust, it's, you, you really will, will um, no longer be succeeding in the efforts, the overall efforts. I think uh, kind of moving to the next um, area of important work that needs to be done, we need to be setting really robust, ambitious targets around vaccine and medicine development. And a report that was put out by the administration in September, I think was a good sum up of what needs to be done. That was called the American Pandemic Preparedness, uh, transforming 
our capabilities report. That report came with a very tall price tag, which was not funded. So it's not that this work is already in action, but it's a pretty good game plan around what should be going on. Includes uh, much faster timelines, the ability to modify vaccines more quickly, antiviral work, including design and monoclonals. And then building on uh, the last couple of years of success around distribution and, uh, and recognizing that we have a healthcare system, which is pretty, pretty challenging uh, in terms of distribution of these products. But just a few words about my particular experience around uh, testing um, in the last year, particularly in the last five months. Uh, the administration's COVID testing strategy revolved around four major goals. Goal one, was to increase the number of sites where people could be tested. So for people in this room, most of us probably have a private sector or a healthcare, healthcare setting where testing might be available. But for a lot of the country, they don't. And even for those of us who do, it's not necessarily easy to get in to see a particular private, se private sector uh, provider for testing. So at the start of the administration, there were about 2,500 community-based pharmacies where people could get tested. That became a major effort to try and expand that. There are now more than 16,000 of those sites. There are also, in addition, thousands of state and local testing sites, which are funded by CDC and FEMA, 100% covered. So states don't bear any of the costs. There are also free testing programs, which uh, began last February, including more than $10 billion in school testing support, uh, which was distributed through the states but also dedicated testing programs for carceral facilities and homeless shelters and for community health centers and other places where people were living in congregate settings or particularly vulnerable groups. So that was a major part of the administration's plan is to really get testing to places where it is really crucially needed and otherwise difficult to access. And during Omicron, in addition to those things, the administration stood up a series, many dozens of FEMA sites where people could go, particularly in high as social vulnerability index, high SVI communities where testing was not easy to access. The second goal of the administration's testing strategy was to authorize new tests for the US market to really expand what was available. And in particular, there was a focus on expanding the tests, the rapid antigen over the counter tests, because very few were available at the start of the administration. In January of last year, there were zero that were on the market. In the springtime, FDA created a new authorization process, which began to yield uh, in springtime. There were three by summertime. By the time that I left, there were now 16 over-the-counter antigen tests with very large capacity for uh, volume and many, many other uh, companies seeking authorization. It's really only an FDA bandwidth problem now because there are so many, so many, so many uh, companies seeking authorization which relates to the third goal, which was to increase the volume of tests available to Americans. Uh, and the administration used a variety of strategies to increase the volume, including Defense Production Act, large procurements, uh, automation investments and procurements. And so uh, went from basically zero tests per month available rapid antigen tests to close to 500 million per month in January of this year. We now are not using that number at all. That was during the peak of Omicron. Now testing demand has really come down dramatically again, really a fraction, a tiny fraction of what it was in January, which is a really good example of the challenge of continuing to keep infrastructure stable over the course of a pandemic. Every time the numbers go up, the testing requirements go dramatically up. Every time they come down, testing requirements, testing demand crashes. And so what we need is a stability in the infrastructure. Throughout all of this, uh, we had about, we have a substantial amount of testing that goes on in laboratories, 2 million tests uh, a day uh, in, uh, during Omicron. And finally, just uh, efforts to um, reduce or eliminate the cost of COVID testing. Now at this point, insurance covers tests, uh, including over-the-counter tests, Medicare covers over-the-counter tests, each one of those things, because we have a healthcare system that is so divided in different segments, each one of those things is a major challenge with CMS, uh, as opposed to just kind of waving a wand in other healthcare systems where everything is available at once. Going forward on testing, administration is going to be completing 1 billion test procurement over the counter test, putting in a stockpile. 
or a substantial portion of that moving forward on test to treat, uh, which is a program uh, to get people tested and seen by a provider and treated all in one location. And then hopefully Congress will decide to fund the infrastructure. Look, I'm, before I said a little bit about the importance of a very strong federal government. And, and by that, I mean, not just civil servants, but also the political leaders that go in for a period of time that help to lead these agencies. The civil servants are incredible. They are the people who run the budgets. They run the legal offices. They run the complicated programs. They understand the Hill. They have, it's, and I thought I really understood the expertise of the civil service until I got to work with them. And I really just, I mean, obviously uh, it's a big government. Not everyone's uh, uh, the same, but the people that I work with uh, at HHS and then the White House are really uh, just on the, the average person is superb. Um, and so I think we should support that effort, um, uh, both in our language and in our research and in our advocacy and education. Uh, and uh, we should honor public service. And that should be part of what universities do routinely. And I think as a general statement, looking across the country, I think universities really do not value public service. I think Hopkins is different, but in general, I think it should be part of the appointments promotions process. And I think in a lot of places, government is seen as a distraction which I think is wrong. Uh, this is an example of one program that was created out of whole cloth uh, in the government during this crisis. It started off as Operation Warp Speed, eventually now has transitioned to something called H-Core, which stands for Coordination of Operations and Response Element at HHS. This is the HHS program that sets the requirements for vaccines and medications. It delivers them around the country. It delivers them around the world. It works with UPS and FedEx and logistics companies that works with the vaccine manufacturers, very high throughput, very high caliber, very high pace, and is doing an incredible job. Um, and that did not exist before. And just as an example of new things can happen within the government, which are exciting. And uh, I think the people who work there, the, the leader of that effort is also a graduate of Johns Hopkins, I would say, happily. Um, other, we, we need to support state and local governments. We've already touched on this before, but they need the help of expertise, uh, but they also just need the general help of people living in the states, the support to get these complicated programs done. CDC, FEMA, FEMA and ASPRA also have worked closely, very closely with state governments to get their work done. So it's a really important partnership. And then just a slide on international response. Too much to talk about here. Each of these programs could be kind of a, a good, really important discussion for an hour in and of itself, but we need strong WHO. We have, there are lots of other model programs out there that really have played really important roles globally. The US government has tried to really support these and uh, has been engaged with many of these efforts, but um, happy to talk about these later with folks if people are thinking about these particular international efforts, but lots, this is just a snapshot of the kinds of international programs that are important, supporting the, the overall global COVID response and will be important going forward. And then just a couple of thoughts about equity. Uh, we all saw, it was really clear from the very beginning how important um, equity uh, and, and how much of a terrible driver disparities were in this pandemic. And to, to make a difference in the future, we really do need to take on the factors associated with this increasing risk of, of uh, uh, driven by disparities. Uh, over on my right here, is uh, a report, again, written by colleagues at our center, um, Dr. Shuxman and others, about uh, particular equity um, uh, challenges and how to address them. We need to track that data very carefully. That was intrinsic in many of the federal government's programs in the last year and a half. They, for example, pharmacies needed to report on equity back to the federal government. They, it was not part of their data systems when this started. And there was a lot of, I wouldn't say resistance by a particular pharma, pharmacy, but in general, uh, people were not happy about having to create all these new data systems to track equity. And it became really, really vividly clear how important it was and how the people who set up those programs at the start of the pandemic from the CDC, how right they were to really and to insist on monitoring data so we could track the problems and try to address them as they, as they arose. We also need much more effort around the disability community. That was something that um, is still a challenge. I think the administration is trying hard, but for example, the tests that we use, the rapid tests that we use 
for you know diagnosis of COVID, very difficult for people to use who have low vision, very difficult for people to use who don't have manual dexterity, um, and a variety of other problems. The print is difficult to read. So if you start looking at these tools that we use, you realize that there are communities that are left behind, uh, which we really need to attend to. And we know that there are things that work in particular around disparities and I've listed a few here, um, but we can do better. And we also know that we, we can't wait until a crisis to start addressing equity issues and disparities. We need to do whatever we can and a huge part of the school, uh, this division here, I think is working on de social determinants of health. And that work is so important just for everyday purposes around the United States, but that's the kind of work that will help us in managing future crises if we are a less divided, less disparate, less inequitable uh, country when the next crisis arises. So working on healthcare access and uh, seeking coverage for all, that should be our goal. And finally, a few words about Bloomberg and our university. I think what we need to do is to continue to foster the rise of scholars and scientists and practitioners who can do the research and help inform the policy and build the practice and people the government and work in NGOs. We have a lot, a lot to contribute from this school in so many different kinds of ways. And uh, we also need to be out there as educators and advocates for the kind of change that we, we want to see. If you go to Washington, you see industry everywhere and you see academia almost nowhere. And so the more that we can do to bring the research and the work that we do to those places where important decisions are being made on a routine basis and in crisis, the better our society will be and the more prepared we'll be for future crises. And I just put it a very tiny sample of the many crucial efforts that uh, were here. I, in an earlier slide, I had the testing program that Dr. Gronval had, uh, that Dr. Gronval and colleagues run. Uh, I also, I think in an earlier slide, I also had a uh, snapshot of the contact tracing effort that Dr. Watson and our team, Crystal Watson, uh, I meant to include that here as well in the healthcare system report, Dr. Toner and others in our team have put together. But in general, looking across, this is a tiny snapshot across the university and incredibly diverse amount of work, diverse and important amount of work. And I think it's not an understatement to say that science rocked in this pandemic. Science did an enormous amount of good. If you looked over the first year, the second year, it was almost on a daily basis that a new important study would come out from somewhere. And it was obviously it was international, it was connected. A study would come out somewhere in Europe. We would all benefit from it here. So from this point forward, science is gonna do great things. We should be at the forefront of that at Hopkins. Our research colleagues and other universities will be part of that. So um, it, this is just a call to say uh, that um, the work that you all do is extremely important in this moment and will be important for pandemics in the future and we should keep on going. And a last slide just to say uh, thank you to all of my colleagues, a greatest appreciation for all of them. Uh, they've been working hard through this uh, entire pandemic. Uh, this is not everyone is, is in this photo, but I hopefully included our group here in the text and uh, it's an incredible group of people and I'm grateful for, uh, for, their, for their friendship and for their work. So with that, I will stop and take your questions. Thanks so much. So if there are questions in the room, I guess I'll start with that. And Becky, if you get any questions, I know it's the end of the day. So we'll just see if anybody has energy. Yeah. Uh, Tom, great talk. Um, so many questions I have in there, but you know, one of them is when you're doing the modeling in the beginning of this, you're describing what the future will be. One of the things that's coming out this is long haulers. The idea of these immediate crises that we have, but then the consequent, unintended or unknown consequences of people that are going to be secondary inflammation, all that. How does that fit into future modeling of these kind of uh, the X factor that you described versus acute death versus you know, this morbidity, which is important, but yeah. going out, is there a way to integrate that in from our lessons we've learned over this and will 
over the next several years? Yes, uh, I think there is a way. I think, I mean, would you say, do you say long haulers, do you mean long COVID or do you mean the long tail of all consequences? Actually, long, economics? Yeah, I was referring more to those that get the acute illness, yes. you, know, you know, the yes. essentially chronic sequelae as we define mm -hmm. it or something like that. Yeah, we were just talking about that this morning in our group about the kind of the state of play of long COVID research and care. And uh, we are behind uh, where we should be for sure. And this, your question probably gets at this. And uh, one of my colleagues this morning was just kind of observing that that's not uncommon for many big crises that we focus on the acute moments and we, we don't attend we, at the beginning or even now, we're two years into this, enough about the long-term sequela. Uh, that was Monica's comment from this morning. And uh, I think we can, we should presume that there will be long-term sequela. People did talk about that even in March or April of 2020, but I think we haven't put enough of the general effort behind that that is changing now. The president announced a new approach about three weeks ago, $500 million is gonna be spent on research on long COVID. NIH is coming up with a research agenda. There's new leadership in HHS around this, but you're right. Um, we know some things about long COVID, but we have many, many answers, many, many things that we don't know. Many, in terms of long-term sequela, duration of symptoms, what would make a difference? There's no particular um, case definition that's solid across the entire spectrum or treatment, but hopefully that will change with time. Ebola, right? So Ebola now is shown in semen that you can have these things where it's years later. It's we, yeah, so it's this of idea that. of this next X factor that's at yeah, that's a great point. No, that's a really good point. Thank you. Okay. Anything else here? Anybody else have any thoughts or reactions? Yeah. So, uh, uh, great talk, Tom. Uh, what, one of the, the issue that surprised me in the United States, but it happened in a lot of countries, how many deaths happen in nursing homes? It seems like the state failed to regulate nursing homes. And I don't know how can we do that better. It was a great confusion all around the world, which patient you you uh, leave back to the nursing home, what are the rules, what were the regulations, and lack of human resources to do the, the, the careful work. So it, it, it seems to me that in the new plan, we, we have to think about the elderly, and protect them better and what can we do um uh, it's a really really important observation uh and it is true i think you're absolutely right especially at the beginning of the pandemic it was horrible it it got better over time as people began to think about the processes that would protect people um the kinds of testing but it came at a huge cost because people were isolated they couldn't see their families it was really it took a terrible toll and I think in the last year, CMS, the HHS agency that regulates nursing homes, long-term care facilities, has really tried to strike the balance by making sure that people could still visit their relatives safely, but get tested and have testing, re free testing resources if they couldn't uh, you know, get their own test, make sure that people were vaccinated in these facilities. But I think in general, uh, it stems from you know, a combination of extremely high vulnerability of the residents the people who work there are paid poorly. And uh, we didn't really have strong plans for a problem like this. I think we leave, we're gonna leave the pandemic with much stronger plans, but I think it's still gonna be a place where we're gonna wanna focus at, right from the beginning in a future pandemic with um, non-pharmaceutical interventions and other kinds of, of, of uh, processes to protect people in a, much, in a much stronger way. I think we've learned a lot and it's been terrible. Were there a few other questions? I just had a quick question about home tests. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that we're underestimating our positivity rate because of home testing right now. Um, yet it's really important to have them available for people to know if they're, if they're testing positive. Should we be putting efforts into some sort of a portal for reporting positivity or can we just use this estimate and move forward and put our efforts elsewhere? That's, that's also a really insightful question. So there is a lot of thinking in the federal government about how to make testing with home tests more um, to bring them into the reporting system. There are some programs now that do collect information from home tests, depending on where you live in the country, depending if in a non-traditional setting, if you're getting testing in schools or testing for other kinds of work environments where people are systematically using these tests, there are now programs to bring them into HHS Protect uh, and the databases that HHS uses 
to try and compile every day, uh, but it's still a fraction of the number of tests. Some of the companies like uh, that make the tests that we've used, they have their own systems for reporting, but only a tiny fraction of people opt to do that kind of reporting. So I think it is still not, you know, we don't have a complete, like completely clear picture about what the next steps will be. There has been some, always some concern that people, if they feel like they're being pressured into reporting, that they may also take a step back from testing. The most important goal is to get tested. And then maybe this, another important goal is to try and collect that information. But if that prevents people, if they're nervous about the government collecting data on them and they don't want to get tested anymore, that kind of defeats the purpose. So there is a lot of thinking going on about that, but it, it's not it's not a resolved problem. Yeah. Oh, sure. You go ahead first. Sorry. I have one too. Okay. This is from uh, Guru Murthy Ramachandran. We've not really come up with a good strategy as scientists to counter misinformation. Looking back to February of 2020, was this something that was anticipated, and what lessons can we draw from the future? or future pandemics? I think it, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, it was anticipated by many, uh, probably not enough of us, but uh, by many, including co I have colleagues at the center and I think others uh, in the university on different, different um, parts of the problem. Also anticipated to some extent by the government, but for, it's not really been a particularly fair fight over the years. Uh, I'm looking at Mark here, who studies this in the second row here, who studies this for a living in our center. Um, there, if you look at the vaccine, kind of the anti-vaccine movement, that has been, if you kind of consider that a 10 out of 10, and you look at what we've been doing to try and combat that, it's been more like a one or a two out of 10 from the government side. Um, and so uh, we can do a lot more. We had insights, uh, for example, I think you know one of the projects that you were working on before the pandemic was social media misinformation around communications around Ebola. So there have been research projects. There are definitely, there have been discussions about it. There have been programs around it, but definitely not a cohesive national approach. And I think a lot of this probably, hopefully the energy around the pandemic will drive action forward because it was such a such a, a terror it remains such a terrible problem in the country and elsewhere in the world yeah so first, um, first of all thank you for talking and for all of your service i mean it's you've really thank you for everything you've done it's good it's, thank, yeah we we all owe you a lot um and, and your team um i guess my question was about you were talking about the role of universities in valuing public service and you know now you're coming back here to john top yeah. so I, I was in government before, so now I'm. Where were you? Uh, I, 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 was, I, I was in EIS during the first oh, two years of the pandemic, so now I'm right. faculty here. But, um, but uh, so I guess uh, now that you're back, you see more of like, what vision do you have for the university and for your team and for us to be more able to be involved in, in government and involved in public service and the pandemic response? And like, how would you like to see that relationship strengthened so that the university's resources can be better leveraged? Well, I do think, um, you know, it's not just our university, but I think it, in universities in general, I think it would be it would be valuable, as apparently is the case in other parts of the world, if it were easier to do short periods of time in the government. It's not easy because people have their own clocks that they have to get through their own appointments and promotions process. It's not a, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's an easy problem, but some period of time service would be useful. And I think people are doing that. But if we could, and you've already done it, um, but that would be useful. I think um, as we own, set up our own research projects or practice projects, the kind of the, just the recognition about the whole implementation cycle of policy that you experience, no doubt, with EIS. But um, it's one thing for us to come up with a policy proposal, but it, working in government, you kind of recognize that's the first five percent, and then it's everything else that has to follow. It's the kind of setting up the federal side of that, setting up the local side of that, all of the financing of that, the legal. So I think as we study our own solutions, thinking about the whole implementation of these complex federal policies and getting them to happen, and then advocating for them or educating uh, policymakers from even as an independent outside source, I think the more that we are empowered to do that, encouraged to do that, and to get into that discussion, where there's just not kind of like unopposed industry views, I think that would be good for 
universities writ large to be able to do? It's a, it's a great question. I'm sure I'm just beginning to think about it more, but our, our center, for example, really is, our goal is to make, like the outcome should be change. It's good to have an outcome be a paper, like better, you know, nature paper would be fantastic, but really, unless it's, unless there's a change behind that, that's not exactly what we want. We want to try and think about the changes as we're executing projects. Anything else? Yeah. One more? I think we're just one more question. We're way over, yes. Yeah, and yeah. has one from And then I can share the other questions in the chat with you. Perfect, okay. This one is from Mike Clagg. I believe that the CDC's reputation was damaged because of political influence early in the pandemic. Are there thoughts perhaps in the current review about how to protect CDC and other agencies from such influence? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Thank you, Mike. Um, even there was an article this week about this uh, that talked about the pressure that CDC was under in the earliest months of the pandemic around uh, policies around religious gatherings and the pressure that CDC was under to try to permit them when they when their own work was showing that there was too much danger to allow gathering. And I think um, there's no easy solution because scientists are gonna be working with political leaders and that combination is gonna continue into the future. Uh, I think in this administration and in the past, there has been a real attempt to try to not interfere with CDC or FDA or NIH and a clear, kind of really clear objective uh, that's not always, um, it's not always, you know, you, we've seen violations of that clearly in this pandemic. Uh, the more that we have distinguished leaders like Rochelle Walensky, Tony Fauci, uh, Vivek Murthy, others who are in charge of agencies of government who are kind of follow those communication principles about honesty and telling people what they know and what they don't know, the better that will do. Um, but I think um, it's, it's, also important that our political leaders on the Hill in particular recognize uh, what it takes to run a modern organization, CDC. It's got incredible people, but some of its systems need more funding, more modernization, same with our state public health agencies. So no easy answer. I think it's definitely recognized as a big problem. I think this administration has really gone out of its way to try to step, have a clear division between White House and scientific leadership. But um, obviously, uh, it was a real challenge in the first year, and, and it's going to be a challenge going forward. Well, um, I'll just take this opportunity to thank Professor Inglesby one more time, and thank you all for coming, and thank you so much.